Ahmed, just so you know, uh, we, uh, in terms of what Darkstar does, we have uh, a hardware platform, uh, which is a hybrid circuit having to do with uh, both uh, classical and uh, quantum technology, a circuit, uh, which is based on, on Dr. Khan's designs. And what we were excitedly talking about was uh, to uh, have your work be embedded uh, into our circuitry as a way of making sure that niceness reigns. And uh, Sharon, I'm going to pronounce your name that way. So, so I, it's a much nicer way versus until I learn how to say it properly. Uh, Sharon uh, is our printed circuit board uh, intern to be where she's done extensive research and will be coding, uh, micro coding, micro etching, uh, the actual uh, circuitry, uh, which will be printed. And uh, in this way, uh, Ahmed, your soul will live forever uh, in our microchip technology. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> That's a good. Uh, we're really blessed uh, to have uh, interns and interns to be uh, like, like Sharon. Very thankful that we have Vera here. Uh, Vera uh, is uh, effectively our director of media. Vera uh, is the COO of We Working Women, uh, the North America's largest Chinese uh, women who work group, uh, which features $100 million clients, specifically the CAD T uh, stablecoin in Canada, where we're going to have a meetup uh, later on this month uh, about that as part of the expanding technology. So Ahmed, just as uh, we're here to uh, review and, and have another excited conversation as we did yesterday about the tech that you represent, uh, we will also be sharing uh, the bigger picture as to where we can see that deployed. And our goal is to create the, the circular economy. With that said, I would like to uh, give you the floor, Faisal, as the creator as, uh, of uh, MISA, Middle East, South Asia, quantum uh, meetup. And perhaps uh, you can begin by, by introducing uh, your former student and friend, and now friend of mine, uh, Ahmed. Uh, Faisal, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, yes, it's my pleasure to, uh, you know, bring to you uh, Ahmed Khayat, who uh, was my student, uh, certainly uh, at Khalifa University. But I actually met Ahmed uh, much longer before that, uh, you know, uh, informally where he had uh, interest in cryptography. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he was, uh, I, I believe you were an undergraduate at that time, Ahmed? Yes. Yeah, exactly. So he, yeah, he approached me and we had a, you know, very interesting discussion, actually discussions, if I remember correctly, uh, about uh, algebraic, uh, you know, methods in cryptography, coding theory and so forth. And it was really amazing for me to actually have him in my graduate class uh, several years after that at Khalifa University when he was enrolled in the uh, graduate program there. And uh, that class was, I believe, on probabilist probability and random variables. And uh, of course, Ahmed, you know, shown, <laughs> he, he was a star student. And uh, it's really amazing for me, amazing feeling for me to see him now uh, almost about to finish his PhD. Uh, and uh, he's going to be talking today about the work he's been doing during his PhD at Khalifa University. Uh, so besides being a PhD student uh, at Khalifa University, uh, Ahmed also um, is a director of strategy affairs uh, in the Muhammad bin Zayed University for Humanities. And uh, he also has a uh, master's in cryptology uh, from a French university. Ahmed, could you please remind me which university that is? Encima University. Beg your pardon? Encima Polytechnic University. Wonderful, wonderful. Excellent. And uh, he's a PhD candidate, as I mentioned, electrical engineering and computer science at Khalifa University. Uh, and I see that his current work that he'll be talking about is under the supervision of two good friends of mine, uh, 
Professor, Doc, uh, Professor Dr. Chan Yon, uh, who's at Khalifa University in the EC department, and Professor Ernesto Damiani, who actually has uh, been my mentor when I was at Khalifa University. So, uh, Ahmed, obviously you're in good hands. <laughs> and uh, I, I look forward to your talk, of course, today, and uh, you know, looking forward to hearing you finish your PhD, the good news, and uh, hopefully collaborating with you as a colleague later on. So, it's Dave, uh, thank you. Dave, back to you. Do you want to? Oh, thank you. Uh, you, thank, thank you. And uh, we're uh, be behind me. You, you see the, the the Dark Star logo, uh, as well as behind uh, Vera, our, our media director. Uh, uh, Faisal, uh, you represent Misa, but of course, you're a founder of, of Dark Star. Uh, the what what I like to do is just uh, recognize the excitement uh, around what we're building here. <laughs> Uh, and where Ahmed, you're, you're part of. Uh, Faisal, uh, you taught for 10 years uh, at Khalifa University, correct? That's right. Yes, and, and you taught mathematics? Uh, I was in the mathematics department. I certainly did teach mathematics, but I was also was involved in teaching uh, some information security courses and uh, developing a uh, program on quantum computing uh, quantum communications, to be precise, uh, in the Center on Cyber Physical Systems, which is led by uh, one of uh, Ahmad's advisor, uh, Dr. Ernesto Damiani. Yes, yes, this is this is great. So, uh, uh, the the uh, the good uh, uh, professor Ernesto, Dr. Ernesto, uh, he was both your mentor uh, as as well as currently overseeing uh, Ahmed's work. Mm -hmm. This yes. connection is, is wonderful. And uh, Faisal, uh, you have 20 uh, papers, 20 scientific papers uh, having to do with, with qu quantum. Uh, could, could you qualify that for me, please? Uh, that's correct. Yeah, there are about 20 papers or so and uh, uh, several uh, presentations and uh, proceedings and conferences as well uh, beyond that 20 papers publications. Yes, yes. And in fact, at those conferences uh, is, is where quantum startups find you uh, and bring you into the fold. Uh, uh, what I'm doing is just walking uh, uh, us through your, your background and then tying it together uh, with, with Ahmed's work. The, it was in fact at one of the conferences that you were approached uh, by Quantum Computer Inc, uh, Q QCI, is that correct? That's right, yes. It was a conference in Munich uh, where, where that happened. Beautiful city. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Uh, and uh, you, in fact, uh, were are currently part uh, of, of that firm uh, as you are with, with Darkstar, where you're a founding board member. That's right. Uh, for Quantum Computing Inc., I serve as a technology advisor. Yes. And uh, the, in addition to that, I understand that uh, you have some editor responsibilities uh, with a uh, possibly known scientific uh, organization by the name of Springer. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Certainly. Uh, yeah, Springer Nature um, is, a, is a public scientific publication. So, uh, you know, Nature is pretty well known uh, and Springer used to be well known and uh, it used to be called Springer Verlag. And I think they combined with nature several years ago. So now it's a you know, more uh, efficient, much bigger organization uh, serving the scientific uh, community. And uh, one of their publications is called Quantum Information Processing. Uh, it's a, a journal that I serve as an associate editor for. Very good, very good. Uh, and I could go on, uh, but I want everyone here to appreciate uh, who Dr. Faisal Shah Khan is. Uh, uh, sh uh, Sharon, uh, this might be more information for you. And I'm also speaking to our audience uh, in that uh, those of you who are here want to be here and uh, may be interested uh, uh, in working with us. Uh, and to be more aware of our, of our projects. And so I, I want to help you appreciate uh, who, we, who we have here. Uh, Sharon, uh, you might have uh, just learned a few more things uh, about, about Faisal. Uh, now, the companies that I'm, I'm mentioning, and there are others, 
all have to do with the work of Dark Star. So I'm, I'm half promoting uh, MISA, Middle East South Asian uh, meetup group, uh, which is scientifically based. It's unique in, in that way uh, and is a cornerstone of Dark Star. Uh, we're very proud uh, to be sponsors and to support. In fact, we are, we are executing and building off of those 20 scientific papers uh, that, that uh, Dr. Khan has. And this is where uh, you, you fit in, Ahmed. And uh, by the way, Ahmed, whatever you did back there, suddenly you look more chic. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, the auto light in my office, so I need to move a little bit. Very, very nice. Uh, I would I would say that your extra chicness is because of, of Vera. Uh, prior to letting everybody in, Vera was giving us tips on tricks on, on how to look good. Uh, so part of, of being a part of our group is we all learn how to look better. Isn't that nice? <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Quite nice, Ahmed, as, as you have this. Very nice what you've done there. What uh, Ahmed's uh, presentation has to do with us is uh, Ahmed uh, has done some unique research where it has to do with understanding the human brain state, uh, having to do with uh, is it a happy brain or a sad brain? Uh, and these are important terms that Vera's son Aaron, the quantum kid, came up with. Uh, Aaron is a 10-year-old. He's in school right now, Vera? Yes. Yeah, so yes, he's in, a regular in, school kid. <laughs> regular school kid, yes, who we do pull out of class uh, as we did at our previous meetup uh, featuring Captain Cole. And uh, Captain Cole, who will be joining us a little, little bit later, uh, if he hasn't joined us already, is a Boeing 777 and 787 pilot where we have an application uh, that potentially is of interest uh, to the airline industry. What I'd like to do at this, at this time though is our Mon Capitan uh, has appeared, uh, Mr. David Wilkinson, who is the founding CEO of Darkstar. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everybody. And what uh, David has been uh, up to is exciting work uh, having to do with, with uh, ceilings, uh, which uh, is part of the excitement as we have the Defense Department uh, who has of interest uh, in, in our work. And so, Ahmed, uh, we, we bring uh, uh, this, this group uh, who is very excited about the goodness that, that you are providing. Uh, this might be a good time, uh, Ahmed, to uh, pass the microphone uh, to you. And what will happen is uh, myself and, and, and Faisal and, and David and even Vera, uh, we will chime in uh, to talk uh, with you as you begin to present your, your slides. Uh, what we might want to do, though, is first qualify that uh, Ahmed, uh, uh, you're you're uh, not a quantum uh, computer expert. Uh, you bring in your expertise. Perhaps uh, if you could describe it for a moment, then I'll come back and uh, connect the dots as to why we're excited to have you on a quantum meetup. Uh, Ahmed, you have the floor. Thank you so much. So um, thank you, Dr. Faisal, and thank you, Dave, uh, for this wonderful introduction. Um, as has been said, um, I have two hearts actually. One is my education and um, another is my uh, <clears throat> leadership um, uh, profession I'm doing with and, and, and directing um, uh, the strategy office and uh, previously in the uh, education uh, regular, uh, regulation in Abu Dhabi and now in uh, one of uh, governmental university is Mohammed bin Zayed University for Humanities. And uh, I'm trying always to bridge between these two hearts uh, as to, uh, uh, to, to uh, have more um, effort in, in managing a technological uh, kind of project. And um, I lead this um, 
technology related um, initiatives in Abu Dhabi. Uh, for example, uh, um, the, the initiative that, initiative that went, um, or has been deployed over a large number of uh, educational institutes here in Abu Dhabi uh, to do with um, digitalizing uh, all the educational services that will be provided to the public. So I'm trying always to make a connection between my education and my actual uh, profession uh, strategy office. So um, uh, I'm currently a PhD student in Khalifa University and um, uh, my project mainly uh, do with uh, information security, but this time is uh, uh, a bit different by integrating um, biomedical knowledge with uh, security and to, uh, to bridge between them. And um, uh, we have um, a nice idea um, over where we are using um, biomedical uh, uh, you know, engineering and connected to, to, as you said, the information security area. <clears throat> to build up a solution that uh, we are targeting uh, mainly for um, to serve uh, the national uh, critical infrastructure as we call them that could be a nuclear website a nuclear um, uh, infrastructure or um, as they were saying uh, could be an air fly uh, um, industry or army industry and so on so we are targeting this um, critical infrastructure and to provide them with a solution yeah, that yeah. Uh, hopefully becomes, um, you know, provide um, uh, stronger uh, access control uh, solution in the insights. Yeah, so yeah. Um, if you... Um, if you if you wish we can we can start to uh, the actual presentation and go through the, uh, yeah. the actual in, in, in uh, I, I appreciate that thank you for that thank you for this moment I would also like to to uh, uh, to appreciate uh, that today is International Women's Day yes uh, and we have uh, Vera and and, and Sharon uh, on our on our team to represent uh, women uh, and. Uh, we'd be open to any commentary uh, of uh, how the approach that Ahmed is using, uh, which I recognize as bringing two worlds together. Uh, Ahmed, there's a technical world that you have, as well as the humanities world. You're bringing them together. The humanities uh, uh, represents the heart of everything we're up to, uh, where we can have people coming together uh, in, in peace uh, and in productivity, uh, men and women, uh, uh, anyone who wants to join, anyone who wants to uh, be part uh, of the approach that we're taking, however they want to be acknowledged and, and recognized, there's a place uh, for all of humanity. And uh, Ahmed, having a humanities background, in fact, being a, a director for this uh, is a wonderful, uh, wonderful thing. Those are, those are, are, are my comments. Uh, I'll just pass it over uh, to uh, to Vera. Uh, uh, do you have any 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 words that you would like to talk about or mention uh, to Ahmed before he starts? Any requests uh, as a representative of International Women's Day? Well, first of all, thank you for giving us the wish on such a special day. I do feel um, a lot of privilege as a woman in this time um, that we get a lot more chances and opportunities um, to be acknowledged. And we have a, a lot more opportunities in the future to not just promote ourselves, but promote the next generation, which is why um, I personally decided to work with um, Dark Star and I have a a really good um, feeling about the quantum um, world and quantum as a future. And I'm really glad to be part of the meeting today. Uh, I'm really excited to learn something new from um, the presentation today. So I will um, leave it to the presenter. Oh, that's that's wonderful. Thank you for that. Uh, and Vera brings uh, her, her 
Quantum Kid Sun. Uh, we're actually looking at your your presentation, Ahmed, from the point of view uh, where where uh, Aaron, the Quantum Kid, will draw a little comic strip, uh, which will represent the minutes and his viewpoint. And he he does uh, have a conversation with his mom, Vera. I I promote that he also speaks uh, to his Disney uh, princess uh, singing sister. Uh, a, a lovely little five-year-old who comes on camera and sings Disney princess songs. Uh, these themes are about humanity. These themes are uh, about uh, what is the most important uh, thing to us. Uh, uh, I'll ask uh, Mr. Wilkinson, and if Vera, if you could unmute Mr. Wilkinson for, for a moment. Uh, David, do you have any, any requests uh, uh, for uh, Ahmed and his talk uh, which is ab about bringing humanities uh, and, and technical world together for national security uh, infrastructure. No, I, I don't know if I have any requests. I, I'm very excited to, to hear the presentation. Uh, it, everything that I have heard about it sounds incredibly interesting. I'm very, uh, very thrilled to, to hear what he's got to say and don't want to delay it any further. <laughs> Well, that's that's uh, very kind. I would mention that uh, Mr. Wilkinson has a, a background uh, in biology and in fact represents our biologic uh, product line, uh, which we'll be uh, sharing a little bit later. Uh, the work that Ahmed has done is groundbreaking in terms of, of uh, brain. Uh, uh, and we have, I believe, a mechanism uh, of mimicking what's happening in the brain uh, through AI neural circuitry and uh, quantum uh, technology. So uh, Ahmed, the, the world now awaits your presentation. You, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, so I will um, hopefully uh, make some excitement uh, throughout the presentation. And um, Hopefully the idea will be in, uh, in interest to what, all of you. And um, of course, uh, further collaboration on the ideas will be most welcome. So um, let me start with um, the title of, uh, of our work. So we, this is a novel EEG risk framework to identify insider threats in a national critical infrastructure using deep uh, learning techniques. And uh, throughout the presentation, I will, I, will, I will guide you through all, you know, the different wording that has been used here in, in the title. EEG risk framework, uh, identifying inside the threat, uh, and definitely deep learning uh, techniques, which is in, uh, now in uh, its a um, big interest area to, to, uh, to, to many industries. So uh, throughout the presentation, we will um, go through, uh, through seven, uh, let's say, stop stations. <laughs> so we will do a short introduction and give some uh, background. And then uh, we will uh, state uh, the problem that we are trying to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to resolve or to, uh, to work on uh, and to solve it in our, uh, with our project. And then uh, we will talk a little bit <clears throat> more about the, uh, the major, uh, let's say, objectives of, of, of the project and the methodology followed to, uh, to achieve the current result. And then definitely we will show up uh, the, uh, the final result we obtained, and, uh, which is actually quite a uh, good result in compared uh, to other uh, similar works. And, uh, internationally, and um, uh, we will uh, also show you some um, relevant and similar works uh, that has been uh, that has been done in the last uh, two years, and, uh, and then we will, uh, with the support from uh, Dr. Faisal and Dave, um, we will uh, bridge between this work and. Uh, quantum uh, computing uh, area. And uh, hopefully uh, the presentation will be, will be useful uh, to your industry or uh, to the current work that you're, uh, you're doing. 
So to start with uh, some introduction and background, um, uh, I would like to say that now, uh, you know, cybersecurity threat is really a global challenge and all the um, uh, institutions uh, and um, organizations that have uh, uh, strong IT uh, enabled uh, infrastructure is uh, focusing on because um, uh, as uh, you all know, um, cyber attacks now became uh, very strong and uh, attacks are actually coming from uh, the external world, but also from the internal world. And um, people were arguing uh, actually uh, like, how, what is the, uh, like, uh, um, the highest um, uh, attacks is coming uh, uh, from the external world or from the internal world. And um, Milan University actually made uh, a study and showed um, they actually met uh, more than 2,134 uh, executive directors in different organizations. And they asked them one question, what is the most common cause of a breach was in the last 12 months? And the survey result came back surprisingly that more than 61% of the attacks are happening actually from the internal uh, employees and not from the external uh, threats. So if I can if I can add some some impact to that, uh, Ahmed, uh, I was quite I was quite interested when you made that statement yesterday that the majority of, of of the problems of the cyber attacks come from the inside of the company, not the outside. True, true. And uh, actually this breach um, with this study um, was showing that, uh, you know, it could uh, cost you uh, uh, from a hundred thousands of dollars to millions and even can, can cause a complete shutdown to your business. So uh, this is how big the impact of the insider threat can, can be or can cause an impact on your uh, organization and business. So uh, this actually brings up a challenge is, uh, you know, like how we can discover these insider threats uh, and how we can detect them before they can create um, a harness to the organization or an impact to the organization. And this is exactly the statement of our problem. So um, uh, the statement is in a national critical infrastructure, how can we discover or have a system that can discover these internal threats and uh, not to just uh, discover them uh, after the, uh, the impact happened, but also to be productive and uh, proactive to, uh, to, to their impact on to their intended uh, attacks. So um, many organizations actually uh, like um, nuclear power plants uh, and so on, they, they actually currently is doing what they're doing. They, do, they run like a psychological test uh, to the internal employees. And uh, by time, of course, employees get used to this uh, psychological test and uh, they can easily uh, take uh, the, uh, the result, uh, you know, psychological uh, test can, uh, can target for. So uh, after a couple of uh, trials, uh, employees get really used to it and they know the, the questions and they definitely can divert uh, the results and manipulate the result based on, uh, on the reaction and answers and body language and so on. In addition to this, um, I'm aware about few companies who tried also some techni 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 technology-based solutions like um, uh, measuring the ECG, the heart rate, uh, during the psychological test. And uh, a recent study has showed that even uh, the ECG is actually uh, a person can manipulate uh, his heart rate using some uh, breathing technique. So uh, they can hold their breath for, um, for a couple of seconds and then breathe out and they can manipulate their uh, heart rate uh, 
capture. Ways, ways of ways of defeating, and I can I can attest to this. Uh, uh, my background includes working for uh, Atomic Energy Commission uh, of Canada. Uh, security uh, is an issue. I'm uh, what you're speaking to. I, I I can't publicly talk about it, but what you're speaking to uh, is something that is relevant. Uh, and uh, what happens over time is the biometric uh, typical, uh, the 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 truth detector, the lie detector becomes easier and easier to defeat as we become more sophisticated, especially for those who use Zoom uh, and uh, are, are beginning to learn uh, what they look like and how to hold themselves in certain ways. They learn how to lie better. So the approach that you're talking about is, is of concern, not only with national security, uh, well, sorry, not only with atomic energy uh, uh, organizations, but as well uh, with national security. Uh, so your work is is groundbreaking, uh, Ahmed. Uh, very relevant. Uh, please continue. So um, uh, we are actually targeting to build up a solution for uh, this critical infrastructure to support them. But we have defined like four main features of um, how the system should look like or should have as a feature in order to uh, to make that system deployable and reliable and practical in, in a way. Mm -hmm. So the first feature is to definitely be a smart with a high accuracy rate system. And what we mean by that is the use of the new technology, artificial intelligence. So we don't want to have um, um, a system that is not, um, um, not smart enough to train itself and to learn from historical data and to improve base, base on that. So um, the second feature was we wanted to have a system that is resistant against the human manipulation, where a human cannot manipulate the result or fake out the result. And here where the no no novelty of this project actually comes in. And also we wanted the system not to react after the attacks is happening, but to be uh, predictive and proactive in the same time. Uh, uh, and to predict the intentions of creating a harmless in, uh, uh, in a critical infrastructure. And last, uh, definitely, is the, to have um, a system that is practical in use and definitely cost effective, that is, that is not expensive to, uh, to, to, to be deployed in a real, uh, real, real, real uh, example or real world industry. So um, we came up with an idea uh, of using, um, uh, and this is what our project is, is mainly uh, about, is, uh, is using a biosignal, uh, the brainwave, the human brainwave, and um, uh, capture that using a device called electron cytogram device. And uh, analyze this uh, human brainwave using an, uh, deep learning uh, algorithms and um, uh, hope for um, uh, an overall uh, system architecture that will, will, will actually give you these uh, features and can predict the insider threats and their potential or intention to create harmless and, uh, before, before it happened. And let me use you know, the right terminology that we are actually um, focusing on is what you are doing is to build up a framework that will give you an assessment of how fit for duty is an individual uh, to perform his duties as a, a, in a particular time or in a certain time. So um, if no uh, additions, I will move on on my slides. So, um, uh, in short, what we are targeting to do is actually uh, to build a reliable and cost-effective uh, security system that utilizes the human brainwave to monitor and evaluate the mental status of a subject at a certain time and detect any intention of creating harmless in, in uh, organizations. And uh, we have a second target as well, is to use um, uh, or to do an intensive survey over different EEG devices that capture the human brainwave. And um, um, we wanted to uh, understand which device would be more suitable for a real uh, world example 
uh, and also to uh, have um, a high accuracy in detecting the abnormality uh, in human activities, human brain activities. And um, um, uh, the third objective is um, to build up an, um, uh, a data collection uh, uh, customized lab um, uh, and create um, um, a human brain wave based on uh, um, an international effective picture system that is now um, widely used in psychological uh, uh, um, um, tests and um, uh, psychological uh, solutions on, in, in general. Uh, this is um, a well-trusted um, set of pictures that has more than 900 uh, set of pictures that create, uh, that has been statistically proven to create emotions into subjects. So we are utilizing these pictures, and I will show that in, during my presentation, to, uh, to create some certain emotions and uh, mental states uh, and to capture this for every individual as every individual will react differently uh, to certain uh, emotions um, and we want the solution to be an individual based rather than a generic uh, solution. So uh, we are targeting to, to, to build up a setup that will uh, uh, allow us to capture uh, mental states for different subjects and uh, to collect data that will be feeded after in our neural network. And uh, we are targeting definitely to achieve uh, an accuracy rate more than 95% as to say um, that our uh, solution is actually reliable and can be used in, uh, in a critical infrastructure. Wow, and Ahmed, if I may just uh, capture that, that moment there, uh, in the process that you're following here, uh, the accuracy of it, where uh, if you could verify that I heard correctly, what you do is you, sh you show the, the candidate uh, the, or the user uh, happy pictures uh, versus sad pictures, if I can paraphrase, and then you record their brain state. Yes. So yes. you know what their happy versus unhappy mind looks yes. like. Yes, and uh, I will come to, uh, to discuss this in detail during my presentation, but actually this is one of the uh, uniqueness in our project uh, in comparison to other works, uh, as we are using actually uh, a well-respected set of pictures uh, and has a statistical proof, scientific proof, that it, it causes emotions uh, or certain mental states into, into, when you look at them. As a subject, or as a human. This is this is very exciting. So what it sounds like is, so when I look at Faisal's face, it's often very scary. He's like a serious, we smile. Oh, look. In, in the, in the Glad way. to be of service. <laughs> we need to survey that. <laughs> we, so we could do a test there, because uh, as Faisal with this foreboding voice and and, and manner we could then uh, be able to determine if he's in fact in a happy state versus a sad state. Uh, do I, do, is that uh, correct, Ahmed? Yes. Okay, that's excellent. So what I, what I, so Vera, I'm gonna ask uh, that we, we, we make happy and sad pictures uh, for your son, the quantum kid, Aaron, to create. Uh, we'll have Ahmed approve them and then we'll use those as, as, as test features. Uh, so uh, thank you for this. So we're going to actually be, be using this, this product, uh, testing it amongst our own crew to find out whether we are truly happy or, or sad. Uh, at, this, at this time, I also want to recognize uh, Captain Jeffrey Cole, uh, who has joined us. Uh, the, uh, the captain uh, flies around. He provides beautiful photographs, uh, which I'll, I'll, I'll share uh, later. Uh, and the project that we that we have in mind, an advanced project, has to do uh, uh, with uh, fighter pilots uh, uh, and the uh, defense uh, industry. And Captain Cole is the closest uh, thing we have to a, a fighter pilot uh, at this time, other than Vera's son, uh, who, of course, uh, we have to find a way to send into space. Uh, now, uh, in recognizing uh, uh, Captain Cole and uh, our, as a part of our crew, uh, where Captain Cole is 
uh, the effectively director of flight. Uh, he's on our, our advisory board. Uh, back to you, uh, Ahmed, uh, where we uh, mentioned a little bit of, of context. Uh, fascinating presentation. Please continue. Thanks. So um, the last objective is, of course, uh, is to try to increase the effectiveness and efficiency of our uh, overall uh, system architecture, uh, enable to be, uh, you know, to, um, to, to have a trusted uh, solution to the market. So before we start, uh, just a quick introduction, um, you know, um, that our human uh, brain uh, has the mainly four parts, the frontal cortex, the parental cortex, the temporal and um, the cortex. And each of these zones in our brain actually is responsible for certain functions. Uh, part of it is the, uh, like the frontal uh, um, uh, cortex is mainly for cognitive skills and, detect, uh, and decisions, decision makings. And uh, um, the parental cortex is mainly when you have uh, an intention and uh, motivation hmm. and, uh, and so on. And um, these actually zones in, in our brain as, are made of uh, connected um, uh, brain cells or uh, neurons. And these cells, as you can see in the picture here, they are connected uh, through what is called the synapses. And these synapses uh, exchange uh, uh, molecules uh, between them. Uh, you know, in these synapses, the, the, the end of uh, uh, um, uh, the entail, let's call it for the neurons. And this exchange of uh, molecules is actually creating what we uh, know as a human brain, uh, brainwave uh, uh, signals, or the brain electricity. And this the brain electricity actually have um, five known uh, uh, frequency bands. Um, the first one is called delta, and then theta, and then alpha, beta, and gamma. And as you can see, when we move uh, from delta to gamma, the frequencies uh, increase. And delta actually states is actually when your brain is uh, in a total deep uh, sleep uh, situation. And as you have more uh, cautious and uh, you become uh, uh, um, um, more um, uh, uh, active in your brain, the, uh, the frequency increases. So um, uh, this is the, the five band that we are actually um, relying on uh, to discover whether the, um, uh, the subject or the human is actually in a relaxed mood or he is under uh, an intense uh, thinking uh, situation. And I will show you later how we, we create the map between uh, these different bands to our risk uh, framework with four uh, categories. So this actually, these bands are uh, captured using a device uh, that is used in medical area called electron cytogram. And this device has uh, uh, um, a standard uh, called 1020 brain map standard. And it actually, um, what it does, it, it captures uh, from uh, uh, the whole brain, the different signals and uh, uh, gives you an indication of how active is your uh, brain uh, in, in a certain time. Or uh, and this is even used for, um, uh, for many uh, medical diagnosis. So uh, in our project, we can't use this like 20 electrode um, uh, electron cytogram device. What we are using is a practical one with uh, five electrode uh, for now, that's called emotive inside device, the one you can see it here. And actually we are targeting uh, certain areas in the brain, uh, focusing on uh, cognitive uh, processing and planning uh, emotion and uh, impulses regions and intentions. And these regions, what we are actually uh, targeting, 
to understand the uh, or to have a detection for an insider threat in, uh, in, in, in organizations. And uh, we are actually in an investigation of another device with uh, one electrode only to focus on the BZ uh, uh, area uh, that is uh, focusing on intentions. And uh, we want to have um, like um, uh, a scientific proof of that this zone is actually what is mainly required or will, will create the most uh, uh, impact on um, the neural network decision, whether uh, the person is, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, could be a potential to be an attacker or not. And for that, we are using what's called explainable AI, and uh, I will share some, some information uh, later. So moving forward, as I said, um, we are using uh, what's called International uh, Effective Picture System. Uh, this is a set of pictures, color pictures, that uh, create emotions uh, into a, a human when they look at them. And these pictures is attached with the two main uh, values, uh, valence and arousal. The valence value actually focuses on how uh, positive or negative this picture uh, creates on, on, on you when, when you look at them. And the arousal value shows the depth of that uh, emotion. Like for example, if we uh, talk about the lowest uh, pictures, the, the one on top, they are proven that they show uh, a positive uh, or a, a relaxing um, uh, 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 emotions onto you. So uh, your brain wave, as you recall from here, will will not should not exceed uh, the theta or alpha bands when you look at them. And um, based on these two values, we understand which actually picture that causes your brain to go higher in these frequency bands and which actually will keep you in a certain relaxing mode uh, band. And we create a map between uh, these pictures and our risk framework to, um, with four categories. We have high risk, medium risk, low, medium, and low risk. So based on their values and Arusel uh, value, we uh, created a map between this set of pictures and our risk uh, framework. So mainly what, what, what we are doing is trying to show these different um, pictures to uh, subjects and to capture his brainwave during uh, 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 the time when he uh, look at the pictures and then save this as an individual reaction or a brainwave reaction to the different uh, uh, risk framework categories. And then when he access uh, in real time uh, a red zone within the critical infrastructure, what we do is we capture at that time uh, his brainwave and figure out in which band he is now uh, and, and based on the, uh, the uh, uh, based on his previous data, we can we can say, for example, that this employee at this certain time he is in uh, a high risk uh, as his functions uh, brain uh, or brain signals, brainwave signals is actually showing um, uh, a hyper intention uh, um, uh, signals, and this is it translated that he's not fit to perform his duty in that critical zone within a certain time. Is it uh, clear? Shall I move on? I, I, um, I like the fact, <clears throat> excuse me, that there's a, there's a standard here, international uh, effective uh, picture, picture system. So what this tells me is you're, you're using standards where you can and those standards will improve over time. Yes. This is extraordinarily important in that it's a, it's a well-known documented fact that AI systems uh, have in the past uh, be showing a slant this way or that, uh, where it would target the wrong type of people. 
Uh, it's an extraordinary problem, which is being hidden uh, in the AI community. Uh, so I very much appreciate uh, what, you're, what you're doing here. And I also want to appreciate uh, Summit Call, uh, where uh, Summit, uh, you represent from Cambridge, knowledge on these, on these areas. Uh, and I appreciate uh, your text to me uh, in appreciation uh, of these issues and your, your comment uh, earlier. Uh, where possible, we always look at the ethical implica implications. We look to make sure that if it's life or death, uh, we want to make sure there are no innocents uh, who die uh, because of inaccurate information. Once that is handled, uh, then we uh, focus on the uh, rights of the individual Often uh, these individuals, of course, uh, represent life and death decisions. So it's, it's more important uh, that they uh, are contributing uh, to the process of self-evaluation, self-validating. Uh, but again, Ahmed, this is the first time that I've, I've seen uh, the approach of, of using a third party uh, where the third party would be open to uh, uh, making sure that all parties are properly uh, represented. And even the process that we would do at Darkstar is we would extend out and make sure that the different parties uh, that represent different groups uh, would be included in this. And we would even submit that uh, to this organization. So thank you for that leadership. Back to you. Yes, and um, uh, I want to mention before I move from the slide, uh, uh, two things. First is the, um, uh, we had uh, many questions or concerns regarding the, um, uh, the fact that human reacts differently uh, to certain pictures. Like, for example, if we take, um, uh, you know, the, the first set of pictures, if I look at them and Dave look at them, he might react differently to these pictures. So, um, uh, and the level of um, uh, uh, his uh, intention, for example, when, it, when the pictures goes uh, really bad as we go down, might also different uh, from my reaction to them. So um, um, to answer this, this is why we are actually now, uh, what they are doing, we are doing an individual capture of um, uh, the reaction to these pictures. So we will capture Dave's reaction and we will capture my reaction to these different pictures. And we will train uh, uh, the neural network based on their uh, data and my data. So uh, it's an individual based uh, classification. And, um, uh, and you know, uh, the second thing I want to mention here also is that um, many uh, similar work, as I will be showing later, uh, has used, uh, you know, uh, random uh, uh, videos to show uh, subjects. Uh, believing that it could, uh, it will create happiness to subject, or it will create sadness or angerness to, 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 to subject, different emotions. But actually, there is no scientific proof behind them, and this is why we decided to go with um, this international affected picture system, as they have the uh, uh, statistical proof um, uh, attached with them, and um, this is. Uh, uh, a well-known uh, set of pictures that is uh, used in, 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 as I said, in many psychological uh, tests uh, globally. So um, to move on, um, so what we created is just um, a, a lab setup uh, with a computer that has a Java application that shows the client uh, um, for 20 seconds, every picture that we have in these different um, uh, risk uh, groups. And uh, we uh, capture, as you can see in the table, the, uh, we use the emotive inside device to, um, to hang on the subject uh, head and to capture his brain wave during uh, the session. And we try to minimize the, um, uh, the noise that will be coming from the lighting, the body movement, by uh, um, uh, having a, a small lab setup that we, we, we created, we customized in Khalifa University uh, with um, a dark, dark uh, square room and uh, it has a fixed uh, chair. And um, we definitely have um, 
a procedural uh, introduction to all the subjects before they, they start to take the experiment. So with collecting the data, uh, we pass um, um, uh, our data to uh, long, uh, short-term memory uh, RNA, we call it the neural network. And we, we have chosen this uh, as um, uh, the uh, long short-term memory is actually has the ability to store uh, 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 previous data. So, um, well, uh, and that's what the main reason why we have chosen to, uh, to, to work with long short-term memory. And uh, we have also used adaptive boosting as to compare the result between uh, traditional and uh, deep learning algorithms. And the result we get until now, was, so before the result, I, this is like the overall system, just to, 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 uh, to, to give a, a quick introduction to it. So um, um, we, we have like uh, uh, two main stages in our overall system architecture. The first stage is where we, uh, for uh, new employees or um, uh, we register or we capture all their brain waves. So we, we make them run the experiment as we did it uh, with the pictures, the territorial effective uh, picture systems. And we have, uh, we collect data based on this initial stage uh, data collection. And then uh, um, the second stage is when someone is trying to access uh, a critical zone within the infrastructure where in real time we take or we capture the, the brain wave and we compare previous data with the new one, uh, of course, using uh, uh, deep learning algorithms. And uh, based on the four matrix uh, risk framework we have shown, we uh, uh, grant uh, an access to the subject to this red zone area, or we recommend not to, uh, not to give an access you know, in, in that particular time. And um, um, also I will mention here what I was saying um, uh, or I was facing before in, uh, in some concerns that people would uh, argue like um, uh, how, for example, uh, can you say I am a threat uh, to perform my, my duty if, for example, a subject get a call from uh, a colleague or a wife or, uh, you know, with a, with a sad news or a bad news. So um, he's emotionally reacting to this uh, call. So how would you distinguish between uh, that subject and an actual attacker? And actually, that's what we are saying in this project. We are not... Uh, 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 detection, detecting an, uh, an actual attackers, we are actually uh, detecting a potential or um, uh, making sure of um, um, what we call fitness to perform uh, duties. So we are not saying he's uh, an attacker, but rather saying he's not fit to perform his duties in this critical zone at a certain time. Mm -hmm. So, and this is what we are targeting in, in, in the project. And Ahmed, if, if I may underscore that, uh, the uh, this is such a good approach that you're taking. You're not you're uh, the the fitness uh, to perform the duty. So their 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 state of mind. Uh, what happens uh, is when uh, foreign uh, interests uh, that are counter to, for example, Canadian government interests, uh, a typical approach uh, is to cause uh, a particular resource uh, to become weak uh, in a moment. Uh, so it's a manipulative process. Uh, and in those moments is, is when uh, there is a strike. Uh, this is uh, something that for many is common sense. Uh, and for, for many is, wow, I didn't know that. Uh, so the approach that you're taking here is really understanding at what point is there a vulnerability? And uh, what's so important about this is when we are vulnerable, we don't know it necessarily. Uh, what you're providing is a feedback loop uh, where there can even be self-assessment and in fact create strength in that moment in the recognition and the awareness uh, that we are weak. So through, by creating awareness, you're creating strength. Back to you. 
And um, uh, as we were discussing uh, day before, that this actually is a solution uh, um, can be can be used in several uh, industry, like for example um, in the uh, um, airline industry, for example. And um, um, I'm imagining like if we are able uh, to have a data about um, the mental states of uh, a pilot. And then in, 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 during a critical uh, flight mission or, um, uh, you know, we, we have a, an actual data during the flight of the pilot and can detect. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, Ahmed, uh, so Ahmed uh, out of respect uh, for Captain Cole here, uh, I'll just uh, bring again the focus on uh, military pilots. Uh, yes, military pilot. When yes. when a military pilot uh, is uh, uh, on a mission, uh, their mental state uh, is is important, uh, absolutely uh, critical to that. Uh, and uh, Captain Cole, uh, did you want to make a a comment, uh, uh, or or have Ahmed uh, continue? Uh, give us a moment, Vera. Could you unmute uh, Captain Cole? Hello. You have the floor, Captain Cole. We can hear you. Yes, uh, this is uh, very interesting. Um, I, I think there is applications in, in civil aviation as well. I think um, um, we do medicals. Um, uh, it's been changed. It used to be every six months. Now it's it's yearly. Um, when I was selected initially for pilot selection, we actually spent a day with a psychiatrist and went through. Um, these types of pictures. Um, there was a whole process, ink blots, uh, testing, uh, psychological tests. So I, I think for selection, there is definitely um, some, some way to rule out people that just wouldn't be fit for the position as, as, a, as a pilot. So I, I think that um, um, it's, it's definitely something that uh, could apply to civil aviation as well. Um, the only thing would be is, is is this something that you do every time somebody checks in, if there's a quick way to see what their mental state is, or is it just that you get assessed once a year? Um, we've seen, obviously, in aviation, there was an incident in Europe years, a few years ago now that a pilot locked himself in the airplane and crashed it because he was going through some mental issues. So, um, But I think it's definitely a, a lot of potential. Well, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Captain okay. Cole. Uh, always appreciate. And what's wonderful here, uh, Ahmed, and, and what MISA represents is we have the subject matter experts. Uh, those who are joining us are, are hearing these comments live. Uh, this is an experiment where we're providing input where we're able to uh, bring those SMEs so that we can have a discussion and uh, cause uh, the, the software and the hardware platforms to perform uh, as per expectations. This is something that's very rare in any development world. I'm, I'm a software developer myself and, and so have helped construct this process uh, through the generosity of, of, of Dr. Khan. Uh, and of course, it's now an important part uh, in uh, Darkstar's uh, process that we're listening uh, rather than, than assuming. So thank you for that, uh, Captain Cole. Uh, back to you, Ahmed. So, uh, for our experiment, we have collected uh, a brainwave from uh, 17 subjects, and we have more than 10,000 throw of data. And uh, the result we have uh, obtained by building our neural network using uh, Keras library in the Nakoda Jupyter notebook resulted in having with the long term term memory RNN is 80.91% of accuracy and uh, classifying um, uh, you know the mental states of uh, subject and map it to uh, the, the four uh, risk categories uh, framework but with the adaptive boosting we have reached 79% uh, of, of accuracy 
and um, uh, we are still uh, building and uh, strengthening our system by uh, manipulating the um, the neural network configuration in the parameters and um, we are currently um, reaching a much better accuracy than this even but i couldn't share this data because i was um, i'm in the process of publishing the the result so it was uh, unethical to, uh, to to share this uh, result for now but uh, i will be sharing them and uh, when we complete the publication uh, inshallah and um, if we compare this accuracy with uh, similar work even in uh, 2021 uh, you, you Many researchers have reached uh, until now 91% in, uh, in uh, traditional uh, uh, learning algorithm like KNN and uh, support vector machine, SVM. But um, uh, in comparison to our work, we, we, we currently having a very competitive uh, result in, uh, in comparison to, to, to these works, recent works. And um, just to share some uh, information about similar work, this is um, a work that has been done in the University of Oxford. They used a different um, device uh, to capture the human brain wave with uh, 14 uh, electrodes. And uh, what they uh, were trying to do, they were designing an experiment uh, to capture uh, personal information like uh, uh, the PIN code of a uh, bank card, uh, a recognition if a person is actually aware of um, certain uh, pictures, like uh, they show a list of uh, uh, criminals and uh, they, they, they have an indication whether the, the subject is able to recognize or is aware of some of this, uh, pictures, these pictures, and um, they get uh, uh, an extent uh, to extend this work to get even the, the to know the names of the person by showing him uh, certain letters and to guess the final name based on the uh, um, EEG uh, signals reaction to uh, when he when he looks at, at these uh, letters. And um, many questions or challenges uh, are with this is, uh, yes, um, um, they, uh, they managed to, to extract information, but uh, there is no uh, smartness in their uh, solution. So they did not use the neural network at all, all statistical analysis. And um, the experiment setup itself is questionable actually in, 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 in research. So um, uh, the second um, very promising uh, research is with the uh, KAIST University in Korea. And um, what they did is they uh, uh, collected data for um, uh, 11 uh, subjects and they were showing um, a set of uh, scenario questions. So, um, 70 scenario based questions uh, and they are all yes or no answers so they uh, for example will ask a subject uh, will you be able to or will you be willing to handle um, or to give your access card to a stranger in the national critical infrastructure and so on until you know they reach uh, hard questions with uh, would you be uh, willing to plant a bomb and and critical infrastructure and so on. And um, based on, uh, um, uh, they're also using uh, 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 deep uh, uh, neural network CNN to, for their analysis, but the accuracy did not reach more than 75%. And they extended the, their work, this is the, the third one, with uh, more participants and they added more uh, scenario questions. So from 70 to 140. But still, many is still questioning, like how did you design these questions? Why do you believe these questions actually would uh, react similar uh, uh, impacts on, uh, you know, on this, in different subjects, uh, brainwave reactions, and so on? 
So um, um, I am done with here. Uh, so this is the um, uh, mainly the uh, the project ideas. And to summarize, it's, um, it's to use the brainwave signal to understand or to examine uh, fitness to perform duties in a critical infrastructure. And this gives you an, uh, a very good uh, indication uh, of you uh, whether you have uh, an insider that could uh, be a potential to create uh, an attack or to, to become an, uh, a threat to, to, to your organization. Thank you. So uh, I'm, 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 uh, I'm done with, uh, with the idea and um, uh, I am um, seeking for the support from uh, Dave and Dr. Faisal uh, as the bridge and to show the link between uh, this work and uh, quantum uh, computing. Yes, that's, uh, that's lovely. So first of all, thank you very much, uh, Ahmed. Uh, a fascinating presentation. Appreciate uh, how you're comparing how things are. It shows, it shows awareness, it's called environmental scan shows the maturity of, of, of the work that you're, that you're doing. And the uh, thank you for bringing it back to us uh, for a, a uh, to bridge it to, to quantum. I had mentioned at the beginning uh, that, uh, so Darkstar, uh, Darkstar Quantum Lab uh, specializes in, in quantum work. Uh, my background uh, is with quantum inspired algorithms, AI and, and blockchain. There is a, a need at some point uh, for quantum uh, when, for example, very variables uh, become overwhelmingly uh, large. Uh, whereas the nature of your work uh, can be streamlined where we can uh, simply use AI and, and not use quantum. Uh, but because of the amount of data uh, that can be expanded upon and as the brain scan information comes forth, uh, this is where uh, quantum technology, from my point of view, can become uh, more more useful. Uh, Dr. Khan, uh, could I have your, your comments on that? Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, um, Emma, thank you, one, first, first of all, for such a, an, an insightful and enlightening, certainly for me. Uh, you know, when I was at Khalifa University, uh, I would hear colleagues uh, such as your supervisors talk about this stuff, and I would be like, what are they talking about? <laughs> So uh, finally, I understand quite a bit of it uh, and how it's actually so practically useful and uh, immediately useful, in fact, right? Um, you know, the, the, the implications and applications to mission critical uh, scenarios is, uh, is just, um, it's imperative, right? Uh, so, so that's great. Thank you for that. Um, I will be happy to connect to quantum computing. I think there's some very uh, obvious ways to do that. Um, if it's okay with you, Dave, uh, may I start doing that or? or... Yes, yes, of course. Okay. You're, you're our quantum muscle, Dr. Khan. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, Vera, if I could share my screen really quickly. Uh... So I suppose, Ahmed, you would have to uh, stop sharing yours, I suppose. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and share this very nice paper uh, that I should uh, first show you all who the authors are for. Uh, the, here are the authors. Uh, I know uh, some of them. Uh, I know Jake, uh, Jake Biamante. We were uh, at Portland State when he was an undergraduate and I was doing my PhD. Uh, the late Peter Wittick, uh, I met him very briefly a couple of years ago in Canada. Uh, uh, I also know Nathan uh, YB, I believe that's how his last name is pronounced. Uh, met him at a conference in Aspen. Uh, I think he was at Microsoft at that time. And of course, Professor Seth Lloyd, who's a big name uh, in, in quantum computing. I've had the pleasure of meeting him as well. And uh, you know, a very nice person to talk to, have a conversation about quantum computing. Uh, so a great group of people who came together and put this paper together. Uh, it's a review paper on quantum machine learning back in 2018. And uh, everybody, I recommend everybody read this. 
what I want to jump into here in this paper is this topic right here, uh, which I've actually, part of which I have highlighted. The emphasis on linear algebra here uh, when it comes to quantum machine learning. So linear algebra is just, uh, you know, one of the subjects, traditional subjects in mathematics. Uh, it's a form of uh, algebra people study uh, undergraduate and so forth levels. And uh, the comment here from the authors is that a wide variety of data analysis and machine learning protocols operate by performing matrix operations on vectors in a high dimensional vector space. So if you're familiar with this uh, somewhat, that just means that you have uh, these huge arrays of numbers, right? Um, and they could be hundreds of thousand uh, of, of you know, numbers in there. Uh, typically when you try to predict um, weather models, right? Like what, what the weather's gonna be like, you know? Uh, the, the, the longer you wanna predict the weather, uh, you know, forecast, make, make the forecast, you know, say like 10 days in the, into the future, the more variables you have to deal with. And you end up with these um, hundreds, hundreds, of, hundreds of thousands of times, you know, hundreds of thousand time variable uh, matrix sizes, so lots of data. Now, uh, weather prediction used to be pretty bad, uh, at least back in the 90s when I was a student of linear algebra. <laughs> And I had a professor who, who would tell us that, you know, he would work at uh, part-time at, at uh, one of the NASA offices in California. And uh, he was involved in that. And he would say the, the, the computers are just not, you know, up to it. They, they just give you, they stop working after a while. You know, you want to predict 10 days into the future, they give you the answer like, you know, 30 days later. <laughs> so it's, clearly that wouldn't work. So uh, that's still the case, right? So going back to Ahmed's uh, presentation, uh, there was uh, obviously a large amount of data that needs to be processed here, right? Now, in one of the uh, two of the other works you mentioned, uh, Ahmed, uh, there was the comment that limited number of people were used, right? Uh, 30 people or 17 in one of them. Uh, so that's a very small sample, right, of the population. That, that's just, just a, you know, like a hiccup in the real picture. So what one could argue. So what you need is like, you know, maybe thousands of people who you want to actually study from this point of view. And they will generate huge amounts of data and classical or conventional computers will actually become choked up pretty quickly. And this is where, uh, you know, quantum computers, quantum processes can actually be useful. Uh, in particular, you have, not only do you have just raw data, you actually want to do something with it, right? Some processing, pre-processing and you wanna apply some uh, quantum machine learning algorithms. You wanna learn something from the data. So to that end, uh, the, the authors here make a very nice broad claim, which I totally agree with, that a wide variety of data analysis and machine learning protocols are based on linear algebra. So if you want to solve uh, or, or do some analysis using machine learning, you should do it on a quantum computer because they're better adapted, you know, uh, adapted to solving and performing operations of matrices. So one of the things they point out is quantum principal component analysis right here. So here, what you're trying to do uh, is uh, work with a covariance matrix. Uh, let me highlight this right here. Oops, that's not what I wanted. Nope, not again. Where is it? Anyway, I'll just leave it like this, right? The covariance matrix of data, uh, which just tells you how the different variables in the data are correlated, right? So something happens to one variable, some other response is measured in the other one and so forth. Uh, this is something we do in, uh, for example, when you're studying finance, right? Uh, you want, uh, you have a portfolio, uh, financial portfolio you want to optimize. Uh, you wanna see how one uh, asset is going to, you know, react to the performance of the other asset and so forth. So this is what it is effectively going on here. And uh, it turns out that uh, a quantum computer can be shown, has been shown actually, they so, say so here, that a quantum computer can exponentially speed up this process over a conventional computer. And I'll just tell you where that claim is made here. Uh, right here, it says classical algorithms for performing uh, this process, PCA, right? Principal component analysis scale as order of D square, right? In terms of computational complexity and query complexity. Compare that to what they're saying here. The quantum algorithm, which would be running on a quantum processor, not on a regular computer, uh, scales as order of logarithm of D squared, right? 
So that's an exponential speed up. And that's exactly what we want, right? It's like, um, that's the, the holy grail of, of all complexity theory scientists, right? Uh, so th these authors actually established that back uh, two or three years ago. Um, so here's an example of where, you know, you would want to, this is a, a bridge between quantum machine learning and classical machine learning, right? Uh, you want to do all your classical machine learning. You want to translate that into a quantum algorithm, right? And send it to a quantum processor so it can do it much faster. So I'll stop there for the moment and, uh, you know, look for reactions or feedback. Well, I'll, I'll give some, I'll give some feedback. Uh, thank you for uh, providing the scientific backing uh, of uh, the statement I made. That I believe that uh, quantum can be uh, helpful here. Uh, and uh, sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm not right. Uh, so with that, with that said, uh, Ahmed, uh, how do you how do you feel? How's your reaction uh, in terms of uh, Faisal's statement here? Did it did it make sense? And and if so, uh, does it does it appear to be relevant uh, for your project? Yes, uh, it's an direct relevant actually to my project, and um, uh, he's pointed actually um, uh, the key uh, success or um, that will create you know in, in, if we're trying to break these uh, two uh, areas is to have a huge number of data. And um, uh, in order to be worth it to, to move in uh, quantum computing uh, and to bridge to it. And um, actually we were planning in this research to reach um, by now a thousand uh, subject uh, raw data. So if you multiply um, almost, uh, you know, 5K raw of data per subject, that would give you a good uh, amount of data. And um, uh, due to the uh, situation that we all uh, live with the COVID-19, uh, so the data collection actually buzzed. And, um, but still, we, we, we do have um, now available two sets of, of uh, brainwave uh, data set publicly available. Uh, that we um, didn't want to, uh, to use in our research as we were talking about uh, customized based data collection uh, process. And, um, but still we can, we can definitely, uh, um, you know, like experiment or um, do this uh, similar experiment on the public available data and and can try what Dr. Khan has shown here in, in speeding up the computational uh, speed, you know, to work over this huge number of data. Wonderful. Good to hear that, uh, Ahmed. Uh, so at a later stage, you know, um, perhaps in your, you know, when you move into your uh, postdoc and beyond, uh, this, this might be uh, something to look into. Uh, you know, as a, as a way of, uh, you know, interfacing your, your, your classical, your, your methodology, scientific methodologies for, for machine learning with uh, quantum uh, processors to, to kind of, you know, uh, well, one of the issue was real time uh, responses, right, from these yes. algorithms. Um, presumably, if you imagine that there's a quantum computer you can access over the cloud, right, and you are sitting in Abu Dhabi and you're doing these experiments, right, at the nuclear plant, for example, with your employees, right, in real time, um, that, that would be amazing, right? This, this would be uh, very useful. Hmm. And, on that, and on that topic for real time, uh, Captain Cole uh, had, had mentioned the question uh, uh, and was uh, leaning towards uh, more continual process uh, where the, the mental state uh, can, be, can be measured. Uh, this sounds like uh, a wonderful potential experiment, uh, and Captain Cole has been very helpful uh, in providing input and, and, and feedback uh, for the projects directly relating to him. Uh, where here we have this this cross meetup, cross project support for some of the more advanced applications uh, in the in the uh, airline industry. Uh, I would take it even one step further. Uh, to say, uh, Ahmed, that in the state of AI, if you look at the state of the art in AI, 
we're moving from AI, uh, which is like Siri, which is like, hey, Google, uh, moving to the next stage, which is known as artificial general intelligence. Uh, so a friend of mine, Dr. Ben Gertzel of Singularity Net, has uh, actually coined that phrase. And his work ranges from, uh, from Sophia the Robot to smart cities. So I then say to myself, it would be very interesting given that advanced AI is beginning to mimic the brain waves of humans, that we should also take the maturity, we should take the uh, responsibility of asking the question, what is the mental state of AI? Uh, and uh, to adapt the approach that you have to AI, uh, for example, as AI begins to uh, support the smart city approach, uh, where it has end-to-end uh, -end, uh, manipulative abilities, I would want to make sure that that AI had our best interests in mind. And on a continual basis, uh, we could be able to determine uh, if it's happy or, or sad uh, as, a, as a gross, uh, uh, perhaps a gross uh, oversimplification. But with that said, uh, these are the things that matter. And Vera, uh, we'll, I'll, I'll ask uh, your son, the quantum kid, uh, to depict this uh, in the in the follow-up notes. Captain Cole, uh, did you want to to make any any comments as as we're in our closing moments? Yeah, just um, just a little bit further to what you said. Um, that's again moving to the next level in the cockpit decision making. It will be AI at some point. So um, this is. Like you said, this is sort of the next step, and and you know those decisions that are made by that we have to quantify. We have to make sure that they are correct, and and that's as you said that um, um, you want a happy AI in your cockpit, and and um, that's something that uh, that we definitely uh, we have to make sure that it's done properly. I, I like that. I, I I see a comic strip uh, panel uh, coming up, Vera from from uh, <laughs> yeah. from Aaron. Uh, the happy AI in the in the cockpit, uh, and uh, in the last uh, two two minutes, uh, Mr. Wilkinson, I I think you you stepped out. Uh, if and you're and you're back. Uh, if we can uh, unmute your microphone for a second, if if you have a, a closing remark or any questions or how you want to lead Dark Star uh, with uh, an idea uh, to apply Ahmed's work. I think that uh, Dr. Faisal really. Uh, hit the nail on the head. There's some some really interesting applications here that I can see, you know, as we kind of explore this area of QML and it, it becomes kind of a little bit more of a reality going forward. Um, I certainly see this tying in with Dark Star projects. I'd love to continue the conversation, and uh, I think we're we're pretty much on track. Is, is there anything else you'd like to add, Dave? Oh, oh I, I, I would, I would a hint of hint the military, military projects. projects. Uh, so, so we'll. we'll I speak about speak that. About that. Um, I hear this there's, there's feedback, feedback and I request. Thank you, David. We got to figure out that that anomaly. Uh, so, as as one of your moderators uh, and uh, partial panel, uh, I would uh, uh, thank you uh, uh, for for that for that work. Uh, I should turn to you, uh, Vera, uh, as uh, you were effectively became uh, a, a panelist. So you're here for. For directorship and make us look and sound good. Uh, uh, Vera, do you have any, any closing comments? I think the, today's meeting um, went really well. Um, I, I, I am personally very interested in this specific topic. Uh, probably I'll have further discussion with uh, Ahmed, um, uh, but uh, I, I do I, I think throughout the sessions and the meetings, it, it, it does give more um, chances for people like me that's non-IT people, a more, you know, more knowledge and um, more opportunities to learn. And um, it's not as difficult as I imagined. Um, I, I keep looking forward for the next event. Thank you. Oh. Uh, well, those those are wonderful words. Uh, as Ahmed, this is uh, we welcome a technical audience uh, to come out uh, today. Uh, but with with Vera's statement, 
uh, that's a, a beautiful statement of how relatable uh, uh, what you've provided. And on behalf of the quantum community, uh, we thank you uh, for the relatability uh, of your project. I'll, I'll turn it now uh, to, to Faisal for, for closing words and to, to end the presentation. Thank you, Dave. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, we are grateful that you attended today's uh, presentation. Uh, you know, we had Ahmed uh, speaking, who uh, told us about some really amazing stuff that's happening. Uh, you know, in, in uh, uh, studying human behavior using machine language uh, uh, and uh, AI ideas concepts. Um, I see some uh, immediate and obvious connections to quantum computing here. Uh, and certainly things that we are trying to put together, we are putting together, in fact, uh, at Dark Star Quantum Lab. Um, the idea that you can, uh, you know, make available in, in real time decision making, uh, you know, uh, with respect to what your uh, machine learning algorithms are proposing or, or you know, giving to you as solutions, right? Uh, We're limited right now with respect to how much data that actually generates. But uh, one promise of quantum computing has been to tackle that, take care of that issue, right? Deal with data in uh, times that are not exponential, right? Exponential time is bad time. It's too much time. Uh, quantum computers can take things down to polynomial time, as people like to say, uh, which is good. You know, that means we can do things quickly. So, uh, Ahmad, thank you for, for this uh, insightful um, uh, presentation. Uh, you know, I, I'm personally, of course, hoping uh, that you are going to finish your PhD very soon, right? Very successfully, I'm, I'm sure of that. And um, I look forward to your next steps in your, you know, in your career to hear about that. Um, so thank you very much uh, again as a speaker. And thank you very much, uh, Vera, for, for being our uh, media person, technical person today. Uh, David Wilkinson, thank you so much uh, for attending. And Dave, as usual, the kingmaker, <laughs> thank you for your wonderful moderation and, and uh, uh, feedback. Uh, I, I, with this, I, I, I end this uh, meeting. Thank you all very much again. All the best, take care.